So welcome to Harvard's John F. Kennedy School Forum. Uh, I'm Graham Allison. It's my honor to welcome back a colleague, uh, an alumnus of the school, and a friend, Bob Zellick, currently president of the World Bank. If Gilbert and Sullivan were writing the script, I think they would say uh, that our guest tonight is, quote, the very model of a modern public servant and certainly one of whom this school is extremely proud. Uh, Bob, as you can see from the uh, program, uh, is not only now the president of the World Bank. Uh, before that, he was deputy secretary of state. Before that, he was a special trade representative. Before that, he was under secretary of state. Uh, but what's impressive about Bob and why people like Dean Elwood and I so admire him is not that he's been a lot of things, uh, but that he's done things in all of those jobs. I've had the good fortune to watch him over the years. Uh, when he was undersecretary uh, in uh, George H.W. Bush's administration, working with Secretary Baker, the end of the Cold War, Bob was one of the architects of the reunification of Germany inside NATO. No mean achievement. If you go back to the discussion of uh, the WTO and China's entry into the WTO, you can't uh, miss Bob Zellick's fine hand. If you go to the creation of APEC, the institution that President Obama was visiting last week, I think this idea first was hatched in the mind of, uh, of Bob Zellick. If you go to uh, the discussion of China's role now going forward as a responsible stakeholder. Bob is the author of that. So I could go on for a long time. I'd say read your program. You can Google him. But we're extraordinarily fortunate to have him here tonight. This is the Robert McNamara lecture. And uh, Bob has asked that in lieu of giving a speech that I interview him in effect, which I'll do for a bit. Then we'll turn to the audience, where you'll have a chance to put questions. Uh, but in order to remember what uh, we're doing as the Bob McNamara Lecture, I want uh, Professor Bob Pastor, a uh, part of the McNamara family, to say just a word. And we're glad to have Margie, the <coughs> daughter, uh, as well. Thank you very much, uh, Graham and Bob. Uh, I'm here representing, I'm here not just as a child of the Kennedy School and a student of Graham Allison's a very long time ago. But as the spouse of Bob McNamara's eldest daughter, Margie, um, please stand, Margie. Uh, and with us today are two of Bob McNamara's grandchildren, uh, my son Kip uh, and Emily McNamara, who's the daughter of Craig, who is the son of uh, Bob McNamara as well. So please stand as well. Uh, Bob McNamara's career spanned four worlds. The world of business as president of the Ford Motor Company, the world of government as the Secretary of Defense, the world of international organizations as president of the World Bank, and the world of scholarship and learning, uh, where he worked uh, with Graham, Allison, and Joe Nye, and many at the Kennedy School, uh, not only reflecting on, uh, on, on, uh, on where we should go from here, but on historical turns that may not have been fortuitous, uh, one of which, of course, was uh, Vietnam. Uh, when he decided on a lecture series, though he is a graduate and a teacher of the Harvard Business School, uh, he felt most attached to the Kennedy School of Government, not only because of the faculty with whom he worked and also because of President Kennedy himself. And he endowed this lecture series on war and peace here for that reason. In September of 1966, Bob McNamara went to Montreal to the American Society of Newspaper Editors. And in seeking to redefine the concept of security, he gave what was truly a remarkable speech. There is still among us, he said, an almost ineradicable tendency to think of our security problems as being exclusively a military problem, and to think of the military problem as being exclusively a weapons system or hardware problem. 
But in a world in which most of the conflicts were occurring in the developing world, he said security means development. Uh, citing World Bank statistics, I think he is the only Secretary of Defense who sounded as if he was President of the World Bank. And in some ways, this was his introduction uh, to the World Bank, uh, though he didn't become president for 18 months. When he became president, uh, the World Bank was a small entity. It lent barely $1 billion a year. 13 years later, it lent 12 times that much for a total value of $100 billion to more than 100 developing countries. He transformed this small entity into the premier development institution in the world. He questioned some uh, conventional wisdom. He went to the Notre Dame University to preach family planning. Uh, and he argued uh, that poverty reduction and economic growth are not only not contradictory, poverty reduction was an avenue to, uh, uh, to economic growth. He viewed his, his tenure at the World Bank as the most stimulating of his entire life. It's therefore very appropriate and a wonderful tribute uh, that the War and Peace Lecture this year should migrate uh, to the World Bank and to its innovative, far-sighted, and very knowledgeable president, Bob Zellick. So on behalf of the McNamara family, I would like to thank the Kennedy School, uh, Teen, Dean Elwood, Graham Allison, all of the faculty and students, and all of those who helped to make this lecture possible, but especially like to thank Bob Zellick for joining us. So Bob, let me, let me start out. Uh, I think it was 1981 when you left uh, Cambridge. Uh, the path has been a pretty amazing path since then. So reflect for a bit for students at the school now uh, who might be like where you were in 1981 about your career and the career opportunities and whatever lessons you can draw from that as clues. I promised some students in my class that you would give them at least three clues to uh, success. So if I think back to being a student in 1981, deeply in debt, is that the? Yes, <laughs> uh, there's one. <laughs> um, well, let, let me just uh, start by thanking Graham and uh, Dean Elwood. Um, I, uh, I very much appreciate not only the experience I had here at the Kennedy School. I was one of the joint program with the law school students. I met some of them uh, earlier today. Um, but what I really want to compliment both is that as a student of institutions and interested in education and thought, uh, the Kennedy School really has done a fantastic job of continuing to be a dynamic place, trying to understand what's going on in the world, drawing very, very good people. Uh, it's, it's really uh, what I find in the world, the World Bank, but also in international services, it's got global reach, um, and it's a real compliment to the people that help build it, uh, as Graham did and as Dean Elwood uh, continues to do. And uh, as someone who's administrated public organizations, I know that's not such an easy task sometimes. And I want to also have a particular thanks for Graham. I'm sure many of you in the audience, Bob Pastor mentioned this too. Uh, Graham has been such a good mentor and friend for people for so long. And I think, you know, Graham, for all the accomplishments you've had in different fields, what I very much appreciate is the friendship you've offered uh, over the years. Um, I, just, I want to say a word, and we'll maybe get into this in the Q&A too. Um, uh, Bob McNamara's influence on the bank uh, was not only a long tenure, but an extremely significant one. And even as I started in 2007, there I come across aspects and elements again and again of what he uh, advanced, his approach on a whole series of issues, everything from developing the capabilities to, in a sense, going beyond looking at investment projects to really opening the field of development. So it's a particular pleasure uh, to be here with a lecture that's named after him. I had a chance to uh, uh, have some conversations with him over the years, first in the Aspen context and a little bit at the bank. And uh, just to give you one little highlight of many, um, one of my early trips at the bank uh, was to China. And uh, I mentioned this to Graham. Um, uh, the, the, bank, the World Bank's reputation in China 
is extraordinarily good. The brand has got a very good name. And it really goes back to Bob McNamara, uh, who opened relations with China in 1980. A good lesson for subsequent World Bank presidents. The US administration didn't like this idea. Treasury tried to stop him. But by that time, uh, President McNamara was going to do what he wanted to do. Um, and when I went to, uh, on this trip to China, I visited Deng Xiaoping's home village. And as I was able to present a picture of Deng Xiaoping with Robert McNamara. Let me see if we can stick the picture up, because uh, last night, uh, here we go. So that was the picture. And uh, so not only did he do an incredible service in terms of opening the relations with China in 1980, and, and if you ask the Chinese, the very significant role the bank was able to play over the years in China's development story, but actually it was a great help for me. So for able to bring this on my first visit to Sichuan province and give the, a uh, copy of this photo at the Deng Xiaoping's family museum. So it was another nice plus. But I just this wanted to. This is a to photo from last night where uh, Ezra Vogel talked about his new book on Deng Xiaoping. And this photo is one of his, uh, is included in the book. So maybe. But I had never heard this story about the, your bringing the picture to the, to the family. I was, treat, I was trained in diplomacy at the Kennedy Absolutely. School. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and for any of you who know China, something like that would be very highly appreciated. Um, uh, and you can't find a better friend than Deng Xiaoping. <laughs> um, uh, advice is a tricky thing. Uh, but um, in the spirit of the Kennedy School, I will suggest six Ps so as to help okay. people recall. Uh, one is um, it's very personal. So I mean, everybody has to factor this through their own preferences and family and kind of interests in life. Um, but the second P is uh, the importance of, of, uh, of preparation. I was talking with some of the other student groups about my experience is a little bit more multidisciplinary than most. But uh, to use the time, uh, whether with your colleagues, whether with the coursework, whether with the broader Harvard environment, because you never know whether what's something that you will pick up or learn or some other aspect can be of, of, uh, of importance. Um, the third one is performance. And uh, again, you know, all of us have good fortune and serendipity in life, but one of the things that I was able to see is, as you get in the world of public service where people move in and out and there's private and public, you never know whether the project you're working on is going to be observed by somebody or the presentation that you make. And they'll remember that in another context or, or something. So that's uh, high performance is an important aspect. Uh, perspective. Uh, now, I may have, again, a bias on this because of a multidisciplinary aspect. But I often talk about a peripheral vision um, and having some sense as you look at a problem about the multiple dimensions of it. And uh, one aspect, again, of our work at the bank is sometimes the pure analytic answer may not be the political economy answer. And if you can't communicate it or deal with the political environment, you miss. Um, then there's solving problems. And this one goes back to something that I guess George Marshall was the first public figure I heard talk about this. But I'm sure many of you that have been in public service have been in a situation where uh, people will come into your office and they think they're serving you by bringing you a new problem. And my view is most days I have no shortage of problems. I've got people coming in from my early morning emails to uh, problems. What I need is some people who bring some ideas on solutions. Um, not only uh, the solution in a substantive sense, but maybe it's a process solution. Maybe it's how you organize something, but how you try to approach something. So it's not to discourage people, but uh, I think anybody who's been in government knows, you know, uh, helping people to help you solve problems is extremely important. And what I found is if you start to put yourself in the decision maker's shoes and start to think about how it is to help somebody solve problems, pretty soon you start to think like the decision maker and you're more likely to be the decision maker going forward. Um, and then the sixth and last point was one that developed for me sort of after the Kennedy School, but many people here would have the opportunity, which is when I was here, it was still, there was a little bit of a sense of policy as a technocratic craft. Um, and the Institute of Politics may help with this, but we live in a democracy under a constitution. And politics is part of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, you know, people have different styles. I'm not necessarily saying people have to go to elective politics or be part of campaigns. But what I encountered is uh, having that perspective of uh, 
politics and policy and how they interact, seeing it in campaigns, seeing how this will influence members of Congress is very important for your effectiveness as a, uh, as a problem solver in an, an American political system. And also, since I spent a lot of time doing international things, it starts to open your mind to other people's politics. And um, uh, what I saw, for example, with Secretary Baker and his Secretary of State, it's kind of interesting. The, at least in most countries, the people who are foreign ministers are also elected politicians. And what really is influential is not only sort of the skilled diplomat or somebody who understands the issues, but somebody who's seen as having political weight in his or her own country and being able to deliver uh, on issues. So Bob, let me say with that one just for a second. So you, you would say to most students that they should get involved in politics at some phase, because I remember you were involved in a couple of campaigns. I was, my first campaign was 88. Um, I, you know, I'm always hesitant to say what people should do. It's, they have to decide for themselves. But I think I would share with them the perspective. And there's lots of ways to do this. It could be working uh, on the Hill for a congressperson. It could be working on a presidential campaign. It could be working, you know, running for office yourself in some capacity. Um, you know, maybe it's as a journalist who studies politics. But having an understanding of how politics and policy interact, I found to be very important to be effective <laughs> in your own system. And this is also, it's a little interesting connection in the world of international institutions. I've sat through a lot of debates often with UN organizations where people talk about legitimacy. And they talk, you know, and there's thousands of ways to talk about legitimacy. And one of the points I always try to emphasize is effectiveness is also part of legitimacy. And if you can't do things, the League of Nations, you know, may or may not have been legitimate, but it didn't accomplish much for very well. So, so applying that to your own institutional experience, effectiveness is also important. And I just believe, and again, this isn't trying to be hyperpartisan, in fact, quite the opposite. My own experience is that you need, if you understand politics, you'll also understand the political perspective that other people bring to it. Mm -hmm. Let me get, take you to the World Bank for a second. And uh, so you arrived in uh, 07. The Summer bank, 07. The bank had, uh, <clears throat> was in a leadership crisis, I would say. Maybe it's a euphemistic way to say. Uh, uh, so here you arrive, parachute in. Uh, how did you decide to approach the, the, the assignment? With great care. No. <laughs> um, uh, the, um, what's interesting, while there was no doubt there was a leadership uh, crisis, in some respects, um, the institution had a deeper crisis. I mean, there, uh, there were people writing articles in Foreign Affairs and others that say, should the World Bank exist? You know, as it's time passed, what is its role? Our private capital markets um, superseded it. So I was approached by uh, Hank Paulson. Uh, I had left the government. I, I was uh, working in finance, and I was approached by Hank Paulson, then Secretary of the Treasury. And I'll share with you the perspective I brought to the job and then some specifics. Because I, I think from a Kennedy School vantage point, the perspective might be interesting. Um, when I s looked at the World Bank, I saw it in the context of, um, in a sense, the, the Wiseman's generation, 1944 and the years that followed, where they created the Bretton Woods institutions, World Bank, IMF, GATT, later the WTO, to deal with what they believed were the economic causes of the breakdown, which led to security and war in the 30s, but also their view of how to try to, how to, try to learn from these lessons uh, after World War II. And so um, in that sense, uh, I asked myself whether <laughs> the multilateral institutions needed to be modernized for a very changed circumstance. Because while, of course, things have evolved, in some ways you could say that system kind of continued roughly until the end of the Cold War. Then there was some enlargement of some of the institutions, World Bank, NATO, others. But some of the fundamentals hadn't been addressed. And if I go back and ask myself, in 2007, just like 1945, would the issues of monetary, international monetary affairs and currency and exchange rate, is that an interesting topic? Uh, are trade issues an interesting topic? Uh, are the connections of development and security an interesting topic? Um, 
you uh, are, are the questions of reconstruction. So the World Bank was created in 1944 to harp with the reconstruction of Europe and Japan. Well, all of a sudden today, the reconstruction issues are Afghanistan and Liberia and Haiti and others. So a different mixture of security and conflict and development. And so it's my view that actually in a world where sovereign states still the preeminent players, the world needed this thin tissue of multilateral institutions, but the multilateral institutions had to be modernized for the challenge. So that's a slightly different background than someone who might come at it simply from a capital flows perspective um, or a pure political perspective. It's seen this within an institutional architecture. Now, uh, one of the things that I tried to do to give that focus, but also play a leadership role, was I, I was banking on the fact that by far most people at the World Bank had come there because they were committed to the mission, they were interested in it. Many of them, I'm sure, were working hard at the topic. And so I needed to get them away from uh, the water cooler talk or the existential questions and get them working on stuff. And, and, um, and so I focused on six strategic themes, which I just touch on. One was the, the role of the poorest countries, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa. And here recognizing, just as a context, you know, you've had the Sub-Saharan African countries as a whole grow on average by about 5% over 10 years uh, before the financial crisis. 5% a year. 5% a year. And so you've got great growth opportunities, and I, we could go a little bit into that. Second uh, was this issue that Bob McNamara talked about at security and development. So uh, my own experience at state and, and uh, treasury and others had shown me that the US government, as well as others, wasn't so good at connecting security, development, and governance, and that these tended to be separate paths. And compared to other intellectual disciplines, whether trade or macro policy, the state of the analytical art, as it were, is, was pretty weak in this. So part of the challenge was, uh, this was later popularized by Paul Collier in a book called The Bottom Billion, is what, do we, what can we learn about how to do this better for the reconstruction of broken or conflict states? Um, the third issue uh, was one that was sensitive and remains sensitive. I have a very strong view on it. And that is, um, how did we need to retool how the bank served so-called middle-income countries? There was a school of thought when I came to the bank that said the bank shouldn't be working with middle-income countries. The bank should just be working with the poorest countries. And if you start where I started with a multilateral system, this would be a mistake of humongous proportions because what you want to do is draw the middle income countries into the system, have them share the responsibilities as well as at the time that you're trying to support them. So if, I, if you think about the rise of emerging markets and their importance on climate change or trade or frankly South-South development, part of our challenge was how did we change the business model to serve these countries? And here is the key lesson that a lot of what the bank does isn't finance. It's the knowledge and learning and the transfer of knowledge and learning and trying to build institutions and markets over time. A fourth one uh, was kind of interesting because this was, I ran into a little conflict with the board on this. Um, I wanted to put a particular emphasis on the Arab world. And some of my, one of the challenges of the World Bank is it has a board that was set up before the Arab air travel. So I have 25 board members, each of them have a staff, there's like over 300 people that's a full-time board uh, with staff uh, that has multiple board meetings a week. And uh, like it's, it, it's an interesting, it, 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 that's actually a very perceptive observation. It's a mixture of a corporate board, a parliament, and uh, a multilateral uh, negotiating body. But so uh, fortunately, I was saved by the Arab countries. The Arab countries actually said, we wish you'd give us more attention and focus on this. So I, don't, I would far from saying that I was prescient about what was going to happen a couple years from now. But you could feel the earth moving is that you, know, you could see Arab societies and the challenge with openness and, and youth bulge and other issues. The fifth was global public goods. So while we focus on countries, what could we do as a convener, a catalyst, an idea, a problem solver to deal with issues, whether they be environment, trade, international financial system, or more recently we've done a lot of work on uh, natural calamities, which is an interesting area that Japan will highlight next year with our next annual meeting. And then the sixth and last topic uh, was one that I actually picked up with some discussions in Brazil before I took office, which was cutting across all these areas is the role of bank, the bank as a knowledge and learning center. And this, this is an important evolution because in a way, you know, 
we've learned the hard way in development and other figures that sort of top-down, elite-driven models often are doomed to failure. So part of the challenge is how could we as an institution democratize the development and knowledge and learning process and, and play a role as other developing countries bring knowledge and experience uh, for uh, compatriots? And how could we, in a sense, share it, transfer it, customize it? In some ways, it's the type of challenge that a McKinsey has uh, in, in sort of its operation. So those were six organizing themes. And frankly, that's a pretty full plate. And it put people, but it also, it goes back to the original question of if you ask yourself, well, is there a role for a World Bank? I don't know. Those six topics look pretty good to me. And if the bank is in a position to uh, emphasize them, I would suggest there definitely is a role for the World Bank. Let me just get you to drill down for a minute on what, pick one of them. And as one of the, I mean, if I were, this is now for students, if I were kind of categorizing what's special about Bob Zellick's sort of magic, I would say it's a capacity for doing strategy, but embedding that in institutions and operations. So it's not the piece of paper that's interesting as much as it is the guidance to then institutions and, and practices. So yeah, pick one of these and what does it actually mean to take that thing well, and, I, in some and ways institutionalize it? It, yeah. it cuts across all of them in a way, and, and that is, but it, I want to take the, the broader point. Uh, a former colleague of mine wrote an article recently, I read, which is kind of, you know, most of the people who are drawn, at least to federal policy service, like to make policy, okay, and they like to debate policy. But there is a role for execution, you know? And so I'm kind of a strong believer that in addition to the design of policy, you need to think about the implementation, the execution, the bureaucratic effects, the communication, building support, coalition, so on and so forth. And just think of the number of great ideas that have been lost because people don't you know, focus on those aspects. So in the case of the bank, I think cutting across all these, uh, I'd highlight a couple of things. Some of them may seem simplistic, but they reflect a little bit of the culture of the institution. One is seeing developing countries as clients and trying to help them solve problems. Now, this may seem obvious, but we had a lot of, a lot of high quality minds that are kind of used to applying an analytical solution, a textbook solution, if you will. And what I was trying to encourage people to say is, if that doesn't fit the political economy context, the institutional context, we haven't solved the problem. We have to people, uh, people address and solve the problems. Now, to be fair to people, and this shows you the challenge of a multilateral institution, you know, we're not, we, we have 187 different shareholders, all different political systems. Um, and in a way, it's easy for people to say, going back to a little bit the what I said about the Kennedy School, we have, a we have the technocratic solution. We're not going to be involved in politics. And in a sense, what I was also trying to say is, but if the technocratic solution is divorced from the political and institutional context, we're not really doing our job. Okay? Now, to be fair to people, they don't want us, you know, we're not supposed to be involved with politics. But so at what point does good governance, anti-corruption, transparency, social accountability slip into politics? And what, what I was basically able to see is that there's a tremendous amount you can do in those topics if you frame it right. And, and so part of this was getting people to see developing countries as clients. A second um, sort of element going forward is uh, the notion of how we as an institution also needed to be more transparent and accountable. Um, all of you know about you know, demonstrations against World Bank, IMF, I don't know, Harvard, other, and, and so one of the, the key points here is these, this goes back to the mid 20th century. These are sort of hierarchical institutions. They look distant and separate. What can one do to kind of open them up? And moreover, can you make better decision making? So if you believe as I do in kind of a pragmatic style of learning from doing, you know, you want to open up the channels so that people can engage you on these issues and learn about mistakes and, and kind of also recognize these things affect people's fundamentals of life. So let me give you two examples. We're the first multilateral institution that created a Freedom of Information Act process like the one we modeled it after the US and India. So what that means is we have a negative list. So as opposed to just saying what you release, you can ask what, you know, we have a certain category of exceptions like FOIA, and you can ask and get any of the documents unless it fills and falls into an exception. We actually have an international judicial body that will determine this. 
Um, this is important in terms of starting to show the openness. But I think something else that we stumbled into, but I think maybe the but one of the most important legacies of the bank, is that over the decades, the bank has developed incredible data sets, incredible information sources. And this is another good bureaucratic lesson for people. Um, I would go to sessions, and I'd have often sort of a senior researcher come up to me and say, oh, you got some great data sets, but you still charge for them. And I'd go back to my economic research people, and I'd say, why are we charging for that? And they'd say, well, we're adding value, and we need it. And normally, and, you know, eventually it took me about four times to figure out what this really meant was it was like two or three million dollars added to their budget because they could charge for this. Okay, so we decided to open up all these data sets. And so we have over 7,000 data sets going back decades, totally open for free. And we're now actually working on a whole series of software applications to make it easier to access. We work with Google so you can get on our website and you can pull up the country. You can see where all the projects are. And the next step I'd like to be able to have would be to have interactivity with a handheld device so that people in a village might say, well, this is what you think is happening in the project, but this is really what's happening. Th this, this is transformative in terms of constituencies with the bank, learning with the bank, challenging the bank as an institution. So I think it's very important uh, stuff going forward. Um, a third aspect is the ongoing challenge with governance and anti-corruption. And this was one of the issues that was a crisis point uh, was a source of dissension when I came into the bank. There are a lot of different reasons for this. Part of the simple managerial issue was uh, we had an internal investigatory system that would produce reports, but we didn't have the wiring diagram of what they do at the bottom. So my first day I come in, there's 50 page single space reports that say, oh, we've discovered all these problems, but it's eyes only and only you can look for it. That's a little hard to do as a CEO, okay? So what we had to do is create a system to be able to, to follow up on that. Um, and uh, as you think about it, maybe it seems simple, but how does the internal investigatory staff work with the regional staff? How does it deal with the board member? How does it deal with the country? How does it deal with the other potential donors? The wiring diagram of this becomes not quite so simple, but you have to have one. Then, and this is an area where Ben Heinemann and others here have helped us with, you got to go the step beyond. Not only our own investigatory system, but what can you do to improve the governance, anti-corruption, social accountability. This connects with some of the transparency issues. So there are practical lessons that also come back to, I guess, one last thing, which is to always have your eye on results. Um, in one of the things that Bob McNamara added to the bank was that it were very weak data, very weak understanding about things. And he actually did a huge step in starting to collect data on problems and actually building the economics and analytical staff to start to look at this. But it's easy for institutions that are doing what they think is a noble social purpose to fool themselves. Um, and it's what I call the, it should have worked, wanted it to work, could have worked, but it didn't work issue. So part of this is in challenging the institution to challenge itself, you need to create the right results, accountability framework, and the openness and transparency. So let me get, I'm going to do two more questions and then we're going to come to the audience. Let me first take you up to uh, sort of theory for a bit. So Bob, you've thought often about the ways in which economic or financial institutions help shape an evolution of politics and even security. So I remember when you were first dreaming up APEC, you were thinking it was going to somehow create a bit of a community and one thing leads to the other. In the WTO case, similarly. So tell us a little bit about your theory of the case of the ways in which economic or financial arrangements end up having impact. I mean, the Euro is not a bad example, but you can pick any example you want. Well, this is incredibly open-minded of Graham to ask this because one of my hobby horse complaints about the foreign policy and national security community was that after World War II, it was taken over by the gremlins of nuclear security and deterrence policy. Mm -hmm. And the hard, the, the, the hard uh, uh, security uh, uh, sort of students. And America lost a sense of the critical interconnections of economics and security and politics. So let's go back a step. If you're, you're a student of history and you think about uh, power and influence, it often started with territory population, resources, at a later stage technology, then also how you 
connect to open seas to be able to uh, sort of uh, interconnect with other polities. And there is, there's actually, you know, a wonderful literature. If you actually go back and look at Adam Smith, not just what people say Adam Smith said, but what Adam Smith actually wrote about, or Alexander Hamilton, or Friedrich List, you know, there are uh, fascinating concepts about the economics and national power, which showed up obviously in things like mercantilism. So mercantilism was trying to take the economic power and use it for the state. And part of what Adam Smith also raised is, well, is there a separate role for the individual's self-worth and the individual empowerment? Now, if you think about um, sort of uh, this in a historical sense, let me, let me take one older period, but I mean, you could, if you look at US economic history or in, in diplomatic history, it runs all through it. But take the Napoleonic Wars, okay? So most people would um, probably, if you have students here studying the Napoleonic campaigns, they will look at, you know, Austerlitz or, um, you know, the role of Horatio Nelson and the sea power and so on and so forth. What they skip is that dusty little chapter that no one wants to read which is how Pitt the Younger restored Britain's credit and thereby enabled Britain for 20 years to finance not only its own war and the Royal Navy, but coalition, where Napoleon had to do it by cash. He either stole it or he sort of printed the money to do it. So part of, I mean, a big part of Britain's staying power was its economic capacity going forward. This should suggest something today, too, I mean, about, about sort of national power. But, but take it in a more, more, more recent case. Um, you know, the, the first Gulf War, what was this partly about? Energy and oil and natural resources and the dominance that would be associated if you took Kuwait and threatened Saudi Arabia. Um, if you take um, the uh, issues of uh, Sudan, which I also worked in Darfur, to a degree you've got the challenges of a combination agricultural and also a uh, kind of a uh, uh, sort of a herding population in the conflict that was created with drought, which then political people, uh, sort of politicians, manipulated adversely. So uh, when, when you think about uh, the ongoing challenges, they're not all economically related, but the economics runs through it in a very significant way. And this obviously has, you talked about the Eurozone, we could talk about the specifics of it. But here's one point to think about. How can one ignore what the Eurozone drama says about the power and influence of Europe in the international community? So we discussed earlier today, I was at the Cannes Economic Summit, Cannes Economic Summit, and you could see for all the hard efforts that the Europeans had had at their summit a few days before, this was all coming apart. And now the G20, unlike the G7, has a large number of emerging market countries. And they were basically looking at this situation with a combination of either sort of bewilderment or, or pity about Europe being unable to get its act together. And remember, these are the countries that not so long ago, and indeed even today, are often the objects of European or US or others telling them what to do. So the influence, the, what's going on right now in the international economy is going to be in itself an obvious statement about power and influence and the perceptions of power and influence. Let me do one last uh, question, and maybe if you can put up the picture of Bob and the Tiger. No, that's the third one. So as the president of the World Bank, uh, you get to make a few choices of things that you're interested in that wouldn't naturally, uh, or they're not necessitated by uh, huh. the job description. That's not a real tiger. That's not a real tiger? Oh, okay. Which one? So one of, uh, one of Bob's, uh, if, you, if you go to his office at the World Bank, uh, I think the most prominent uh, features are pic pictures of uh, tigers. Mm -hmm. So tell us about that. Where does that come from and what are you doing and what does it have to do with the World Bank's mission? Well, I like animals, always have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <coughs> um, but it's, a, it's an interesting example of uh, how the World Bank is positioned to play a catalytic role with other actors on, in this case, a biodiversity issue. So it starts with this. One of my colleagues comes in and tells me one day that there's 3,200 tigers left in the wild. And, we, we, and if you look at the, at the pattern of their elimination and their habitats, within our lifetime, this iconic species could be gone. 
Um, and we work in addition to, you know, climate change. You know, the tigers are not only important in their own right, but they're a capstone species, so you protect tigers. It often protects prey populations. It often has an effect on um, the type of uh, <coughs> habitats. Um, but here is an opportunity uh, to do good by trying to bring together um, the Tiger Range countries, which we had a unique relationship with because they're developing countries. There's seven, 13 Tiger Range countries. The NGO and civil society community, World Wildlife Funds, others, Conservation International focused on this. Scientific groups, the Smithsonian, um, potential donors, law enforcement, because a big problem is trafficking uh, in, in uh, animal parks. And um, so uh, what we tried to do was bring these players together. And there's also a little story about this, about development. A lot of conservation groups had focused on this before, but I think where they lacked a little bit was the type of relationships with the developing countries, so the developing countries would own it. So we worked with these 13 Tiger Range countries to be able to, that they come up with their own development plans with habitat, with forest conservation, uh, with law enforcement. And your friend, uh, Prime Minister, soon to be President Putin, um, and I actually hosted a summit. He, he shoots them and you... Uh, no, actually, he's, he's, he's a very devoted protector. There's about 500 of the most beautiful tigers called Amur tigers in Siberia. And he's played a big role in preserving them. And in fact, they've actually just protected the Korean pine, which is, hap is a good example, is, a, is what the prey of these tigers eat. So he and I organized the summit in St. Petersburg to try to pull this together. We got about three or four heads of government, ministers from all the countries. And literally, actually this week, we had the first anniversary kind of review of all these groups. Now, the bank can put together sometimes regional finance, and we have this fund called IDA where we, we have some regional set-asides to work with some of the South Asian countries, um, but also now we're doing this with some of the Southeast Asian countries. Interestingly, the law enforcement community, so I did a video with Interpol, where Interpol is now making wildlife crimes a much higher priority, and we're developing the, investiga the investigating capacity of this. Um, and, and helping countries make sure they've got this as a crime on their books and put it as a priority. So it's a classic issue where it integrates uh, multiple communities. And the World Bank, I'm not saying we're the only one, but we're unbelievably well positioned to be able to connect it. Where we can provide financing, and this shows a small part, we also create a multi-donor trust fund to help finance some of these operations in addition to what's done through the GEF, the Global Environmental Facility, the IDA financing. And where I can play a role is I can talk to uh, heads of government or ministers or others who share the same interest and say, here's a practical way to engage this. And so uh, just to give you a little, I hadn't planned this, but a little anticipatory area, one that I'm going to try to push in February is one day I woke up and I thought, you know, we're the World Bank and about, th you know, roughly 70% of the world is oceans. How can we be the World Bank? and ignore 70%. So we've actually, we're working together with a number of conservation groups on a blue economy initiative. And, and when you start to look into this, it's quite interesting. This is oceans policy, yeah. and it's oceans environmental policy, natural resource policy. It obviously becomes very important with protein policy, the amount of people who live off uh, fish species. And it also then gets into islands policy and kind of their economic zones and law enforcement. So it's a good example of how uh, these aren't the principal preoccupations, but with a little bit of, of uh, thinking out of the box. And, and again, it's, it's ultimately helping the clients. And in the case of animals, other than just liking them, I'll say uh, these are an important part of country's heritage. And what, we've done cultural heritage projects, but it's quite striking the sense of pride that it has in countries when you can preserve a species like this. I'm a great admirer, and I would say it shows that the at least you haven't been dulled by living in, a, in an international institution. No, I have three cats at home, even though I'm allergic to them. So. OK, so there are two microphones on the ground floor and two microphones in the loge. If you'd stand up, uh, introduce yourself, uh, uh, put your question, and Bob will answer. So just go ahead and line up at the items, if you would. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Razvan Oroshanu. I'm a student here at the Masters of Public Policy. I was also for a short while uh, working for the World Bank in Romania. My question is about... Was it a good the, experience? A very good experience. Um, you can ask your question. 
<laughs> the, uh, my question is about the Eurozone crisis, and you spoke uh, quite little of it. Um, I was uh, looking at the things that you said following the G20 summit, and you made um, a statement that seemed um, underreported to me and uh, seemed quite strange. So I'm wondering if you can elaborate on it. You said that the spillover effects that are likely to follow from the Eurozone crisis will hit the poor in the developing world and that the World Bank is worried as an institution about what those effects might be. So I'm wondering if you can spell out those likely effects. The crisis isn't going anywhere, it's likely to hit. And the mechanisms that you have in place to address that, thank you. Okay, so I won't answer how to fix the problem. I'll just talk about its effects, but, but, it's, but it's an excellent question. Um, Let's start with this. Up until August, we, what, what the world was seeing was a multi-speed recovery. So the developed countries were growing relatively slow, high, high unemployment. In general, the developing countries had come back quite strongly to the point their major concern was overheating and inflation. The events in August in Europe, perhaps to a degree the debt limit issue here, created a shock wave through the system. And what we started to see, and this is why I started to talk about danger zone in August, was the effect on their equity markets, which in general came down by over 20%. Their bond spreads started to increase. Uh, a number of them, their currencies took a real dive. Uh, we started to see the effect in the trading system. Um, and going to your next stage, what I was most worried about and remain worried about is the fact that if the problems in consumer confidence, although the US numbers are up a little bit today, consumer and business confidence in Europe and, and the US spread to emerging markets, then uh, the domestic demand of these economies would also wither. And keep in mind, over the past five years, two thirds of the world's global growth has come from emerging markets. So it's not only bad for emerging markets, but it's bad for the whole over the international system. Now, let's take one step further. And this is something else that I've been actually trying to decide uh, how to publicize further, although some of it's been picked up in the news over the past couple of days. Coming out of the Eurozone crisis in particular, you, know, the, you obviously have the sovereign debt issue. You also have a banking issue. You have a banking sector that is pulling back fast. Part of this is because of banking regulations. Part of it's because they're not sure how to value the sovereign debt. But so what are we seeing? We're seeing trade finance dry up. For example, I'm very concerned about the numbers in West Africa already. And why is this? Well, you know, trade finance is actually a rather labor and organizationally in intensive business. You can't just put it in place overnight. So what we did in 2008, 2009 is through IFC, our private sector arm, we actually created liquidity facilities. But we had commercial banks to work with, and now they're pulling back. The Central Eastern European countries and the Balkans, in 2009, we created something called the Vienna Initiative, which we worked with the EBRD and the European Investment Bank and the EC, took a little prodding, but said, look, you don't want to pull all the capital out of Central and Eastern Europe, even though you're you know, maybe Austrian banks. Just notice what the banking regulator did in, in Austria recently. They basically said, time to come home, we're pulling out. Okay? Commerce Bank, which is a German bank partly owned by the German government, announced our business now is going to focus on Germany and Poland. So talk about security, you know, you still have some problems in the Balkans, you've got uh, you know, these countries that are in an uncertain process of development, so that's another one. Um, the Middle East and North Africa, particularly North Africa, you know, few things happening there. Uh, if you're going to have uh, loose of, uh, loss of credit from European banks that are credit contraction, that's going to be have an effect. So part of the message here is while the European and the Eurozone problems have to be dealt with primarily by Europe, we got to be aware of the ripple effects of this, and the ripple effects could easily become wave effects. Okay. It's a, a terrific uh, and relates to so many different dimensions. This gentleman, please. I'm Joshua Shiffrinson, MIT, and also the Belfer Center here. Um, you didn't work for us too, did you? Sorry? You didn't work for us too, did you? No, I'm no, just okay. a student. I try to avoid I'm reality. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> Do it um, as long as you can. I'm, I, I'm working on that. Um, <laughs> One of the core issues in international politics, particularly in international economic affairs, but not solely international econ economic affairs, is, as you want to put it, managing the rise of China, managing the rise of India, giving them a stake in the international political economy, making them responsible global stakeholders. Now, 
you spoke also of the necessity for effectiveness as a, as a political outcome, as a policy tool. And so I guess I'd like to ask you, given the time you devoted to speaking of transforming the World Bank, transforming the modalities of the World Bank, what does it mean to give these, uh, give these countries responsible stakes or giving them stakes in a practical sense? What, what does it look like on the ground? Um, I could answer this from the bank's perspective, but then there's the more global issue. But let me just take it from the bank's perspective. The way that most people had focused on this was voting shares. Okay? And it's a highly symbolic and important issue. The bank, as people may know, the, the idea created in 1944 was uh, the bigger economies would have bigger shares. They would be, therefore, the United States has about 15, 16, 17 percent of the shares. Um, and uh, this is done roughly similar in the IMF. Um, and so many people have said, if you look particularly at the European shares relative to the size of their economies, this has to change. And so uh, I, I undertook a very laborious exercise to get almost to sort of 50 percent on this. Having said that, uh, another thing that we did is we added a 25th chair for Sub-Saharan Africa. That may end up being more important than the, the, the voting chairs. We don't vote that much, okay? And, but having another voice at the table, because there were only two chairs for Africa, and there's basically, I don't know, depending on, uh, there's some rotation about sort of eight, seven or eight or nine for Europe, okay? Um, so the voice at the table is important. But in a slightly contrarian sense, I would also go a step further, and that is the symbol of the 50-50 became important. So I ask questions like, well, what if developing countries become developed countries? What if we do our job? So what if they move up in high income? So, you know, should the goal be that Zimbabwe has 50% of the shares? You know, so the point is, is that what does this really mean? And, and one of the reasons I engage in this debate, there's separate debates in the case of the bank versus the IMF, since we do have some contributions to IDA, shouldn't some of the European countries that contribute more to IDA, shouldn't that be recognized in some fashion? How do we get the emerging markets to contribute more to this process? And we, there's an exercise whether shareholders or others to do that. So we've had the first capital increase in the bank in 20 years, since 1988. And in constructing that, we did it in a way where we got the developing countries to put more in, in, in sort of different fashions. That's one type. But I tell you, what I'm most interested in, it goes back to this client point. So in other words, I think the way that you really deal with uh, the, the role of developing countries you treat them as clients, you treat them with respect, then that has other implications. It has, for example, um, the type of learning and knowledge process where you engage them more actively. Another is staffing. So we have staff from 167 countries, I think, at the bank, and about 60% are from uh, developing countries. I brought in the first chief economist from the developing world, Justin Lin from China. Um, uh, most of my managing directors uh, were from the developing world. So, there are aspects of how you run the institution, the personnel of the institution, the client focus of the institution. So Graham and I were talking about this separately. I, uh, it, 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 it may be uh, sort of my uh, uh, lack of certainty in life, but I tend to look at things from portfolios and sort of multiplicity of factors. So I think the way that we bring developing countries into that is those aspects, but then in return, there's also a role for the developing countries to give something back. And what is quite intriguing, and this is, I think, a huge change over the past 10 years, is that increasingly the lessons that other developing countries are drawing are from other developing countries' experience. Let me give you a good one. Um, there, the, Mexico and then later Brazil invented something called the ca Conditional Cash Transfer Program. It's called Oportunidades in Mexico, Bolsa Familia. And these are programs that, um, for about a half of 1% of GDP, which is a pretty efficient amount. They're able to take about 10, 15, maybe 20% of the poorest population. They give them cash transfers or it's done with a card. And in return, you have to send your children to school and you have to get health checkups. It's probably done more for women's health in Mexico than anything in the history of the country. Been very successful programs. We have taken that model and been able to apply it in different forms to over 40 other countries, okay? Now, here's a bigger idea that comes from this. One of the things we learned in the 90s with the financial crisis in East Asia is macroeconomics isn't enough. If you, if you don't pay attention to the bottom, to nutrition, you can lose a generation. 
So actually, out of this crisis, one of the things we're doing with these conditional cash transfer programs, or in some countries that may not have the capacity, is every country should have sort of a basic social safety net, but one that doesn't break the, the, the budget. So in, Mex or so, in, so in many North African countries, they had very expensive subsidy programs. So we're actually working with them to try to ha learn from the Mexican and Brazilian experience. And what's powerful about this, it's not just a paper, it's not just analysis, but when it comes time for the people to actually implement it, we put them in touch with the people who've implemented in other countries where they can deal with this sort of practical experience. So what runs throughout the work that we're trying to do at the bank, practical problem solving, loops coming back, and then ultimately what it comes back to is drawing more people in, more ideas, an open and transparent system. So all of it, you hope, creates a different model. Up in the loge. I'm a sophomore at the college. Uh, my fear is that the eradication of poverty might come with the eradication of local cultures. Like we would all just become a very uh, sort of individualistic economic world. And I'm wondering if the World Bank takes any steps to preserve local cultures or at least work within those cultures. Yes, from a number of different dimensions. Um, I talked about the natural heritage of countries, which I wouldn't underestimate. We actually have a work going on that kind of look at the natural wealth of, of nations. So it's not just the GDP statistics, but how do you value some of this? Um, we've actually, um, one of the things I enjoy visiting because of the historic nature, we also work with countries on some of their cultural, historical, uh, sort of whether it be architectural, other piece things, which I think are sometimes are very important with a country's sense of history. Now, another dimension is ultimately, um, you know, how do you, uh, how do you take this global experience but customize it for local conditions? Right. Um, and this is something that, again, when you work with the country itself, they ultimately need to be the determinant of that, but, and here's the challenge of governance. We have a lot of safeguard policies. So another aspect of this is uh, when it comes time to building dams or many sort of other infrastructure projects, we've developed and we've learned it the hard way, a very rigorous aspect about how you, uh, if you need to, what you do with relocation of pub, uh, people, how you take care of it. So I visited uh, a dam site in Laos called Nam Tung Tu, which is quite extraordinary in terms of the engineering for the water flows, um, some of the people that moved and the different sort of how they were brought back in as kind of villages and families. Now, having said all this, and then of course, there's also what I'll call the particular policies that relate to some of this indigenous people. So right. let's take the, the very good policy of, of avoided deforestation and preserving forests. And one of the first things you learn in that is there's people that live in the forest. So how are you going to deal with the indigenous population and engage them? So we deal with First Nations groups and other aspects. Here's the trade-off, though. For every one of these things we do, they add maybe a little degree of complexity, a little degree of cost. Like my worry with Nam Tung Tu in Laos is it's a great dam but it probably took longer and it costs more. And how do, we, how do we slim it down? How do we slim the lessons down? So frankly, the government isn't just go build other types of dams that don't take this into account. Mm -hmm. But there's one last point, which I'll just challenge your presumption a little bit. Sure. And that is, look, um, ultimately, we need to look to developing countries. And this also is not only the governments, but how we try to engage civil society to make some of these decisions because now and then, and I'm not saying this is what you're asking, but right. now and then some people in developed countries sort of see what they see as sort of native lifestyles and they see them as quaint or nice heritage or so on and so forth. Right. And I just share with you the fact that most of the people that I've seen that don't have electricity, it isn't very pretty, okay? Mm -hmm. now, It'd be better if they had electricity. Pardon? Better with electricity. Yeah. Now, but this isn't, I, I'm not using this as a cop-out. So we're trying to, in, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, only 30% of the people have electricity. So this is an interesting issue because at the same time you're dealing with climate change, this goes right to the dams issue, okay? Some people were totally against dams. But if you don't want coal and you're a little wary of other carbon systems, you know, we've done a lot with solar and, and other types of sort of alternative energies. But hydro could be quite significant in the development, but it depends on how you do the hydro. So ultimately, what we try to share is best practice, knowledge, cautions. For our own project, we'll build in various types of safeguards. We hope people will value these within the system. So th that issue is very important. But at the same time, um, one does have to recognize that the developing country people have to have a say in this. Mm 
Then there's a legitimate question, which again, just so none of this is easy, is which developing country people? Is it the government or is it the people living in the village? And, and th that gets, again, my fail safe on this is the more transparent and the more that we can build in social accountability. So this, to give you something that I did that caused a little stir earlier this year, is I actually said, look, the World Bank worked with governments and then we created something with the private sector and then uh, we, with IFC, and then we've actually had IDA for the poorest. What can we do to actually help develop the civil society sector? Now this is touchy, because you're talking about perhaps funding this, and that has all sorts of issues. But my own sense is, is that to be true to what I've suggested about transparency and participation, you have to figure out ways to try to support this. And one last point, just to highlight, is because I think it gets, it's underappreciated, um, the gender dimension of this. Mm -hmm. We did a world development report this year that I hope will truly be path-breaking because what it shows is you know, gender equality is not only fair, but it's smart economics. So at a time that the world is looking for productivity growth, you have huge potential productivity growth. But it's also a sense of, you know, frankly, women's voice in, in uh, aspects of these changes. Right. Okay, we're, we're unfortunately coming, I've gone on too long, coming close to the end. So what we're going to do is there are four people standing. If you ask your questions, short, short questions, short answers. I'll try. The gentleman here, please. I'll be very quick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm Livio from Italy, from the MPP program. I was uh, working on, with the UN, but then we had the World Bank in a project appraisal uh, in developing countries. So we were in Cambodia, and we had um, a lot of problem in uh, having the endorsement from the government to basically have this project approved, because I guess the role of the emergent donors in certain countries like China, India, Brazil, and other countries are really diluting a little bit the impact uh, that the loans can bring to this country, in my view. And so how do you see the real comparative advantage of the bank in this context of emerging donor using bilateral aid for development projects? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, another good question. Um, number one, um, we should try to figure out how to not stop this. You're not going to stop it, but make it uh, more responsible. and. One aspect of this is working on um, the supply side. So in other words, we actually work with China and others to say, look, we, it's going to backfire on you if you're not paying attention to some of these issues. And again, it depends if it's the government or a company or others. But also work on the demand side. And so we need to work on the countries. So for example, um, there was a big infrastructure project in the Democratic Republic of Congo that had a big government guarantee. Uh, it was, it was a Chinese project, DRC put a big guarantee on it, and um, it was going to interfere with the debt forgiveness for the DRC because it was adding government debt. And we were, we were able to work with the Chinese partners and the Democratic Republic of Congo to separate the public part from the private part. So there are, there are examples where you can try to do this, but you have to work on both the demand and the supply side uh, to make it work. But another part of it is emerging donors can be good things. So I went to Russia. Um, and the former finance minister, Kudrin, was helping to create um, a funding mechanism to work for economic literacy, anti-malaria. He was also interested in Central Asia, and this was very interesting. Some might perceive that you know, Russian policy would be, how can we dominate this? He actually wanted to work with the bank because he felt it would have better policies in terms of the, the developmental side. So I don't mean to be a Pollyanna on this, but the real issue is you can't ignore it, and, and you have to try to prod, uh, and, and ultimately kind of my home base is you have to show how this is in people's own interest for both the recipient and the donor country to try to make it work better. Thank you. Lady Gander, please. Good evening. My name is Shijoni. I'm a, an MPP1 as well from the Kennedy School. Um, my question is probably going to ask you to put on your former U.S. Uh, trade representative hat. Uh, South, uh, so, sorry, South Korea recently ratified um, the bilateral treaty with the U.S. after a very long time, and it U.S. is also talking about a trans-Asia um, bilateral and multilateral trade agreement, uh, which does not make China very happy, uh, naturally. Uh, so as a believer in free trade yourself and someone who has actually introduced China within the WTO regime as well, how do you actually see America's role, current and future as well, in Asia's balance of economic power? Uh, well, um, I'll start by... Sh shortly, yeah, yeah. Briefly. I'll start by saying that um, it starts at home. So the, the, the way that America deals with its economic challenges 
not only the entitlements issues and the revenue issues and budget issues, but ultimately its own innovation, the own structural reform, so as to keep it a dynamic and unusual economy in the system will be the most important either magnet or force in the system. Second, um, I believe that the U.S. has huge interests because, as I've said, if the emerging markets are an increasing source of growth and dynamism, two-thirds of global growth in the past five years, um, those are markets to sell, to buy from. So uh, I'm sort of one of the last free traders in America um, in terms of trying to engage those systems. Um, third, uh, I think that uh, this gets a little bit complicated. Uh, I do believe you can have a competitive liberalization policy using free trade as well as sort of global trade agreements. My concern about the TPP, which you referred to, is I don't really know what it is in reality because most of the countries in it are ones that I negotiated free trade agreements with. So the numbers that are the, it, uh, on top of that has Vietnam, Bhutan, um, New Zealand, uh, not Bhutan, uh, um, Brunei. Brunei. Um, and I'm kind of wondering what we're really going to add, and, and since I actually, going back to politics, labored to get these agreements through Congress, kind of wondering what's the added value and let's see the specifics. And the reason I mention this is um, I wish it were going forward. I wish the United States did have deeper free trade engagement, but I'm very wary of statements not backed by actions. And that actually creates a, a different problem for your diplomacy. So in general, I hope the United States economic engagement, not only with the East Asia region, but all regions, continues to grow and be dynamic. And the last thing we should do is slip into protectionism, which I have to say is a real risk in what's going on in the world economy. So this gentleman, and then finally this lady, and we're done. Please. Uh, uh, hi, Jed Schwartz uh, from Somerville. I was wondering if you, if you think that there's any point where the trade deficit in relation to the GDP gets to be too big and to have deleterious, maybe even extremely deleterious consequences. What might those consequences be and are we seeing them now? Um, the answer to your question is yes, <laughs> on the first one. Um, I'm just reminded uh, just to, for a policy audience to share a good piece of policy wisdom, not from me. There was an economist named Herb Stein that says, if something gets too big that it can't continue, it will stop. Um, so part of this will be a market reaction. But you make an important point, which is sometimes if you wait, just as in Eurozone, you can get cliff effects that could be very dangerous. The, the fundamental thing that drives the current account is the fact that the United States is saving less than it invests and consumes. So the way that I would deal with that problem would be to try to take the steps that would increase our savings rate. And there's ways that you can increase the savings rate through government savings, but also uh, private sector savings. So actually what you've seen is, because consumption has come down with the downturn, actually the current account has deficit has come down in recent times. So the, what I know won't work is building barriers to, uh, to our market. And let me give you a good example. In the Great Depression, the United States had a trade surplus. So, you know, glory be. We had a trade surplus, but 20% unemployment. So the problem, the challenge with the current account is there, there are also things I think the United States could do. And this is something I've been thinking about. I don't have my ideas refined enough yet. But I do think there's things the United States could do like Germany does to try to strengthen the export capacity of some of the smaller firms. If you look at the exports of the United States, they're very heavily related to some of the big companies. It's the function of the fact that we've got a continental economy. We're used to that. People are used to selling things at home. I don't, I don't want to draw too close of a parallel to the German system because the Mittelstand of small businesses are a different model. But it's quite interesting to see how Germany has a very different driven export model. I suspect there could be things that, uh, that, that could help the United, some smaller enterprises do better in exports. All I can say is the government programs that I've seen traditionally, I'm not sure how effective they are at this. I'll make one last point to it, and, and it's a bigger point for government and public policy. If you're going to have a society, in a sense, the current account is a part of the trade deficit question and kind of exports and imports and competition. 
if you're going to have a society that adjusts to change, I do think you have to help people adjust to change. Mm -hmm. And in the whole globalization process is just speeded up the process of change. And this is true whether it's the United States or China or Mexico or others. And here's an interesting thing to think about. Our unemployment policies were developed in the 30s. Our trade adjustment assistance were developed in the 70s. Our Workforce, Injust uh, Workforce Investment Act, I don't know, I think it was in the, the 80s. We have a bunch of policies to get people back to work that are somewhere between 30 and 90 years old. It strikes me they ought to be relooked at and to try to think about how we could use these billions and billions of dollars to put people back to work in different ways. And I won't get into the details of what those would be, but that would be an interesting Kennedy School exercise. Good. Uh, Chris, you get the last question from the floor. Um, Chris Russell from the Belfort Center. You mentioned climate change a number of times, and you also said you're bothered by words not backed up by actions. As you know, the UN conference started uh, on climate change negotiations yesterday in South Africa with a lot of pessimism about the process and the outcome. So is there anything you can think of or comment on in the solutions area that is either optimistic or uh, some way to break the uh, gap between the developed and developing countries? This is, this is another interesting issue of international institutions and negotiations. And what I mean by, I, I, I was the U.S. strategist for the Rio Agreement, okay, which in uh, sort of 1991 and 92. And I actually, I thought Kyoto was on the wrong track exactly for the reason it is, which is that you can see that developing countries are going to be part of this and that if you didn't have any shared responsibility, it wasn't going to be sustainable politically. My frustration with what I saw in Copenhagen and what I've seen in the UNFCCC process, which we've tried to support, is, is that it's devilishly difficult to get together 195 countries to agree on sort of one international framework, particularly if the cultural, the, when I'm saying cultural, I'm saying international diplomatic cultural mindset is kind of a G77, north-south um, um, sort of foreign ministry point of view as opposed to also bringing in the economic perspective and others. So I've, I've spoken to a lot of heads of government about how they need to have teams that include their finance ministries, their environment ministries, their foreign ministries as well. And in a small way, one of the things we created at the bank was something called the Bali event, where each of our annual and spring meetings, I bring together the finance and economic ministers to talk about the climate change issues to engage them. But more specifically, I'll use the Cancun meeting as an example. Um, I spent a lot of time with President Calderon of Mexico months in advance and said, why don't you try what I call the building block approach? So why don't we try to say, if we can get 150 countries to agree on avoided deforestation, if we can get 140 countries to agree on various energy efficiency, if we can get 100 countries to do something in the technology development, the thing I'm pushing now in, in Sub-Saharan Africa is soil carbon. Soil carbon could be another avoided deforestation. It's like an estimated 14, 15, 16 percent of, of, of uh, carbon. It could help agriculture. It's a win-win proposition. It's a wonderful African idea. But you have to figure out how to measure it and design it just like you did with others. So in each of these areas, and I, I, I could we have about a list of seven or eight or nine, you could make progress. If you wait to get everybody and then get all them together, you know, I, I don't mean to shock people that there's always some quarrelsome, difficult country somewhere in the system that's going to hold it up. And so this is a very, this is a good development experience model. Let's be practical. Let's get some things on the ground. Let's make it happen, okay? And two practical examples of this. If the Cancun meeting works, because that's the model that Calderon used, and to give you a very specific case of this, uh, which I shared with some people here, I, I went down to Cancun a few days before the end, and I said to President Calderon, Mr. President, you're doing a good job. He actually organized all his ministries. You're making progress. Beware of the fact that some country, my guess was Bolivia, if you're really making headway, is going to say, ah, we're going to hold this up for whatever they want. Okay? And I said, have your legal people research what consensus means. You probably think consensus means everybody. But one of the wonderful things about international law and diplomacy is there's different definitions of consensus, which is exactly what he did. The Bolivians threw a fit, and they managed to sort of get through that step. I'll give you one more practical example, and this is quite 
powerful right now. One of the, th it's a good example of institution building. Hank Paulson and I cooked up the idea of climate investment funds. And so Paulson, who's a dedicated environmentalist, said, look, let, let's try to raise money. We raised about six and a half billion dollars. And we're going to create some funds at the bank to deal with energy efficiency, technology, uh, avoided deforestation. And we have taken that six and a half billion dollars and we have leveraged it almost nine to one. In other words, with other bank resources, regional bank resources, about 30% from the private sector. We've done projects uh, with over 45 emerging market countries. Every time I do one of those projects, as opposed to taking a country that says, how will climate change hurt me, I, I get buy-in. They see it's in their interest. And some of this isn't whiz-bang technology. It may be transportation systems and energy efficiency and others. So um, right now, there's a big debate about a green fund, OK? And, and I hope it will make progress. But sometimes I have to scratch my head, because in creating these climate investment funds, we went through endless discussions to create equal boards of developing and developing countries. I've got CSO participation. We went through endless governance things and got everybody happy. And we're still making the darn thing work, OK? So here you are debating a green fund in the UN. I got a green fund. It's up and running, OK? And you want to know my main problem now? I've committed all the money. So, I've, you, know, so you want to have an example of practical reality? Let's go with what works. And part of the lessons on climate change is that I, I think the, the, the basic design model of, of, it's hard enough to do this in trade, where you can see the self-interest, and is that the design model of getting 195 countries to agree to something like that, I think maybe it'll come together. If so, it'll only come together if you put the building blocks in place and people can see the mutual interests developing from energy efficiency, forestation, and others. And I, you know, I hate to say it, but I think Durban's going to have a challenge. Well, I think that uh, on that note, I think you could see this mind at work on an issue. And I think it's a great question to end on. Let me say again, uh, from the perspective of Harvard's Kennedy School, how proud we all are for uh, Bob, what he's done, but even more interested in what he's continuing to do. So let's say thank you very much. Just, just to connect and to come back to Christine and the tiger theme. Just to show about how this interesting, we worked with the World Wildlife Fund to come up with the idea of a um, wildlife premium. So in addition to doing the forest, you could get a premium if you save the animals. So again, what it shows, if you do practical things, you could combine the tigers uh, and climate change. And so let me remind you, if you just sit here, tomorrow night there'll be another forum on the mayors on the front line, Occupy Wall Street, flash mobs, and gun violence with the mayors of uh, uh, Philadelphia and Baltimore. And if you stay sitting on Thursday at 6 p.m., there's the challenge of growing inequality. So, good. That's good.